What's up, y'all? Welcome to the Undrunken Podcast. I'm your host, Courtney, and I want you to join me as I talk with real people and have super gritty conversations about their journeys to becoming undrunken. So let's go. Dump the drink, because it's time to get this party started. What's up, y'all? It's Courtney, and I'm really excited for this episode. Um, I'll be chatting with my new friend, Nico Morales. He's an author and a personal development leader out of New Mexico. Um, When his team reached out and said that they thought that he would be a good fit for the podcast, um, they were absolutely correct. I think you're really, really going to enjoy this episode. Um, You know, each episode for me, each interview is like a gift, and it reminds me Uh, I'm reading Dopamine Nation right now, and in the first couple of chapters, the author talks about uh, when she meets with patients, each one, each story is like a gift, Um, and I really like that, and it's kind of like what what this journey with all of you all is like for me. Um, So it's mid-December when this episode is dropping, and I'm really finding myself moving into that winter Harry Burn Nation mode um it's just cozy and kind of in between sports for me uh it's a little cold and wet for mountain biking most days not quite snowy for snowboarding um but you know still making it in for some kickboxing and and getting that that movement going um but i'm also really reflecting on the year and what felt good maybe what I want to change um, or lean into more, for sure where I want to feel stronger. um, And always top of mind for me is the podcast. Um, I've really been reflecting a lot on the podcast for this year and in thinking about planning for 2024. Um, So yeah, with that, let's jump in. This is me and Nico talking about his journey to Undrunken. And be sure to check out his book. There's a link in the show notes. All right. Hi, Nico. Hey, how you doing, Courtney? I'm wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I know a little bit about your story, but I'm really excited to hear the full thing uh, straight from your mouth and uh, hear about some of the awesome work that you're doing in addition to putting your book out into the world. So let's just jump in with um, who you are and... Um, we'll start there. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and hello, everybody. My name is Nico Morales uh, from Albuquerque, New Mexico, born and raised, um, grew up as an athlete, uh, grew up in a two-parent household, grew up with that uh, kind of normal uh, American lifestyle, I guess, as you would call it, uh, from the outside perspective. Uh, from the inside perspective, just like everybody else, I have my own issues that go on. I have my own uh, family turmoils. I have my own adversities I had to face. And the way that I chose to face those with um, was with substances. I started using substances probably when I was like 14 years old. I used to sell loose cigarettes at high school. Um, I saved my lunch money one day and I bought me a pack of prime times. Uh, At the time, they were like three bucks. And then I'd sell the single uh, prime times for 50 cents a piece. So there's 20 of them that come in a pack. So I make myself seven bucks real fast and then, you know, continue to do that. Uh, One of my colleagues at high school, he introduced me to cannabis when I was about 14 years old, freshman. Um, And I was like, huh, this is how most people probably feel on a normal day-to-day basis. And I fell in love. Uh, So cannabis was my first love. Um, when it came to substances and I use love as a descriptive term because uh, you know there's different ways that love can be expressed Uh, and so for me again I just felt normal I felt clear-headed when I was smoking Um, I remember that first day he had passed me a blunt he was in the front seat of this Mustang I was in the back seat of the Mustang they're giving me a ride home but we had to make a couple stops before we got to my house and one of those stops was at one of his friend's house. And we get into the garage and at his friend's house, he has this cooler. 
hanging out um, in the garage and he had a gallon, uh, old gallon milk jug that he had cut the bottom out of, put a uh, cylinder at the top and made himself a gravity bong. So we were smoking out of that. And uh, I was like, okay, this is how people utilize substances. Uh, and I, immediately I was intrigued. Uh, I had a little bit of money because of the loose cigarettes that I was selling. So I started venturing off into cannabis. Um, fast forward. I uh, stayed in school mainly because of sports. Um, as I said earlier, I was an athlete. That's how I identified myself. Uh, I'd say athlete and not student athlete because I wasn't really that great of a student. Um, I really went to school for uh, sports and socializing. Um, but I progressed in wrestling. I wrestled since age seven until 17. And so by the time I was 17, I had a full ride wrestling scholarship to um, a school in Colorado. And um, for me and in my household and in my familial network, that was incredible to get a full ride uh, scholarship was something that nobody had, uh, nobody else had achieved. And so uh, to do that also came with a lot of pressure. Um, and I think that's the side of it that a lot of uh, individuals who are high achieving, individuals who have that kind of no problems at home, no problems in the world, uh, tend to be facing there's a lot of pressure on you to uh, do better than what was already laid out before you right um, my senior year of school I got a new wrestling coach and I had already figured out a new rhythm I had figured out my rhythm and the way that I was running things and I'm pretty stubborn that's one of the traits that I know about myself I'm stubborn I'm thick-headed and I don't like to be told what to do Courtney, anybody could ask me for anything. And if I can do it, I will. Like, if you want the shirt off my back, I got you. If you need a jacket because you're cold and you ask me for it, I got you. But as soon as somebody tells me that I need to give them something, it's like something in my brain switches. It's like, you're not going to tell me what to do. I don't care. Even if it's good for me, you're not going to tell me what to do. My friends and I say, I do what I want. <laughs> there it is. I love that. And that's exactly it. I, I do what I want. And if I want to give you that jacket, that shirt, if I want to give you that money in my pocket, then I'm going to do it. But if I don't, then you're not going to make me want to do something I don't want to do. Um, I say all that because me and this wrestling coach, we butted heads, uh, mainly because he's like, you're going to do what I want you to do, not what you want to do. And I was like, no, I'm going to do what I want. And so um, I left the wrestling program. Uh, I had set it up so that the school that I had already had an agreement with, they, uh, they made the stipulation that, hey, we just got to watch you wrestle once um, and you'll be good to go. So I didn't even have to wrestle that, that year for the school. I just had to wrestle once. Um, and I didn't make weight for the first time in my life. I'm not sure if anybody listening is familiar with wrestling, but it's by weight class. So if you don't make your weight, then you're in big trouble. And for most of my life, I'd always made weight, uh, especially in high school. I wrestled 10 pounds higher than I weighed, so it wasn't too difficult. But in this one season, I didn't. Um, and that really put me into a mental spiral. Along the same time frame, Courtney, I was uh, using my entrepreneurial spirit that I told you about earlier with the prime times. And I just found different uh, products to move throughout the different networks that I was a part of. So it progressed from single loose cigarettes to cannabis, from cannabis to cocaine, from cocaine to pills. Because in early 2008, when I graduated school, that's when pills were heavy in the market. Like you can get them anywhere and you didn't have to go see the traditional drug dealer. <laughs> so you could get them from almost anybody. And um, that's how I made extra cash. Um, my family was very big on school, was heavy on school. So as long as you were in school and you were getting good grades, they kind of left you alone. So that's how I used uh, as my cover up. I was in school, I did good in school. So nobody bothered me to figure out where she could get in the money for this. How come Nico doesn't ask us for gas money? How come Nico can go out on dates without having to ask us for money on these dates? <laughs> where the heck did you get these new sunglasses? <laughs> Uh, those type of uh, conversations didn't happen um, and this was all in high school this was all in high school until about 17 yes ma'am um, and after I forfeited uh, because it was a choice to not continue wrestling 
because of decisions that I was making, um, I went down a more heavy spiral towards that lifestyle. Uh, I was like, I'm already making money. You know, the world had shown me at this point, you know, 17 year old, big kid, a kid. I got all the answers to solve world hunger, world peace. Like this is how things need to be done. Uh, that put me in a mental place where I thought I was a full grown adult by 17. And with some of the experiences that I had, I had more maturity and more experience than my uh, colleagues, but definitely wasn't uh, full grown <laughs> by any means. Um, so I got caught up with using substances um, at this time I'm 18 years old finishing up school and I'm getting 120 oxy 80s um, every week every other week and I'm using 20 of them myself and selling the other 100 within a matter of a day so I'm buying in more oxys from different avenues and trading cocaine for oxys and making sure everybody gets paid but you know, Biggie Smalls is a very good uh, lyrical rapper. If you haven't heard of him, I recommend checking him out. But he has uh, 10 crack commandments. And I remember that song stands out because uh, one of the crack commandments that he has, I think it's number four, is don't get high on your own supply. And I had broken that rule. I was using the substances because I saw what it was doing for the people that I was serving. They seemed to not have problems when they were high. So I continued to uh, follow that path. Uh, cannabis at the time was my favorite thing to do, but I was smoking more and more and more. So when somebody introduced me to Oxycontin, I was like, oh, this is amazing. Uh, my brain, it works very fast. Like it's going a thousand miles an hour. So to have something that slows it down and my mouth and my mind can work together, my hands and my mind can work together, my chest and my mind can work together. It was amazing. Um, and I'm not promoting substances, but maybe if you're listening, that could be one of your, you know, ideas as to why substances will, is so attractive to you. The opposite is true. I have some friends who can't stand downers. Um, they prefer uppers, and that's because their mind is running at a slower pace. And so that speed up makes them feel like, oh, this is that norm normalcy that everybody's after. Um, I find myself using more drugs than I should be using all the way to the point that I'm going through withdrawals. And at this point, I get introduced to opiates, uh, opioids, I'm sorry, uh, black tar heroin. And I'm probably about 20 years old now that I'm strung out on uh, heroin. And I'm doing all the things that come with that IV injection of heroin. I was able to keep a job for most of my life. I started working when I was 14 years old. Um, so able to be a functioning addict, as they call them. And uh yeah, by the time I'm 20, I'm sleeping in a truck um, by myself in a Walmart parking lot, not because I didn't have other places to go, but because the places that I could go, they had rules that were, you can't use substances and we know that you're using them. So if you're going to continue to use them, then don't come around here. And I chose to use substances rather than have a warm place to sleep. Was uh, alcohol rather... involved at this point? At this point, not yet. Um I got clean from opioids when I was 22 years old and everybody started welcoming me back into the communities. And in these communities, that's where alcohol mm -hmm. entered the mix. Um, I wasn't a fan of alcohol growing up, uh, mainly because it had an odor to it. And I know cannabis does too, but you could kind of cover that one up. Uh, alcohol has an odor that just comes out of your pores, uh, comes bloodshot eyes, there's a lot more tells. And so, um, when I'm about 24, I find myself becoming more and more dependent on alcohol. That goes until I'm 27 years old. And by that time, I had repeated the cycle already where I was drinking two bottles of rum every day, um, drinking a half pint of rum just to get my day going, oh, wow. uh, showing up to work with uh, Polar Pops. Uh, Circle K has these polar drinks and uh I feel like the bottom up with rum and put Mountain Dew on the top of that. And I just walk around with that. And as long as I had that, I was good. I was like a baby with his bottle. Um, and that's where I realized that I have an issue. So that puts me at like 27 um, where I was really struggling. And at that scenario, uh, my family was done with me. They were like, Here, we've done everything that we can um, to help you out. And unfortunately, that's not enough. So if you're going to choose that lifestyle, then go ahead. You're grown. You can make your own decisions. My mother had inherited a property from my grandma. 
and uh, nobody was living in it. Nobody was uh, using it. So my mom tells me, you can't live at my house since you drink too much and you know, you're, you're just a mess, uh, but you can go stay there as long as it doesn't turn out to be your coffin. And the ability to stay somewhere uh, was nice, but I didn't have any running water. There wasn't any gas at this place. It was just a building and some electricity, which I made work. And for me, that's where I got to do the self work. Um, that's where I got to figure out like, hey, Nico, why do you depend on substances so much? Why are you so happy with drinking? Why are you so happy with using drugs? Like what, what really makes this all work in your head? And that's where I began my personal development journey, my recovery journey. Um, on the floor of this building with a hot plate and a TV <laughs> all plugged in. Um, and that's where I identified that, you know what, there's some things in my past that I haven't healed from. And one of those things in my past that I hadn't healed from was this idea of abandonment and rejection. Um, situations from when I was a kid uh, being sent off to go stay with my uncles for summers uh, from age two to six, I was hanging out at my, with my grandma all the time. And at the time, you don't really realize it, right? Like you're a kid. But as I reflected back as an adult, I was like, oh, shoot, that's where you kind of develop this idea that you weren't wanted. Mm. Um, and with so many changes happening around you all the time, because you're a fast paced thinking individual, uh, the one thing that never changed was substances. You could like control your world with substances, with drinking. You could count on them. It's absolutely. They were better than people. Like they're going to hurt you, but you can kind of control the hurt that they're going to give you, right? <laughs> right. Well, and I, you know, you said that your family had kind of reached their end with it. And if you're comfortable, I would love to hear what some of the things that happened that led them to that point were. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, well, it probably started with the opiates uh, or let me go even further back. Uh, I'm a very strong-willed individual and my family's very strong-willed as well. Um, so me and my dad, we got our heads butted when I was about 14 years old and um, went to the point where I was a stubborn little kid. My mom was at work one day and he's like, you think you're tough. Let's see how tough you are. And so we got into a physical altercation uh, and I had wrestled most of my life, so I had no problem in doing physical combat with somebody, but I don't know. my dad, he had me when he was like 28, so do the math, I'm sorry, my brain isn't functioning at that point where I can knock out those numbers, but he was a grown man, um, and I was doing that, and he grabs me, because we're getting into it, and he can see that I can hang, so he turns it up a little bit more, and uh, eventually I get tossed into the dishwasher. And the dishwasher busts <laughs> and that's where we uh both look at each other like oh well what are we gonna do now like because now we have to come up with a <laughs> story as to why we did this uh, and my mom knew that we were having issues me and my dad mm -hmm. um so that would be the first one where me and my dad ran into a uh, headbutt and my dad knew that i was headstrong and that i wasn't gonna really listen without uh, some sort of receipts so we just basically left me alone after that point. Um, he's going to let me do my own thing. Uh, my mom, she attempted to uh, stick it out a little bit longer. And one of the boiling points for my mom was she had let me stay at my house, her house, I'm sorry. Uh, and I was probably about like 21, maybe about that time. No, I was probably about 20 about that time. And uh the use of opiates wasn't as far as IV injection. So I was still smoking and I nodded off. And when I nodded off, I fell asleep on the foil that I was smoking on. So when I woke up, I had this piece of foil stuck over my eye. Well, my mom came into the room to wake me up. She was headed off to work. And so when I got up, I turned around and I have this foil stuck on my head. And she just kind of shakes her head and she's like, so we're going to have to have a conversation when I get home from work. And I knew that that conversation was, you're going to need to leave my house. Uh, so that was the first couple with both my parents. Um, after that, there was another situation where I was uh, involved with the police. Um, I had uh, participated in some actions that 
weren't the most ideal and uh, ended up being detained for a little bit of time. Uh, that was another big kind of downfall where my family was just like, what the heck? One thing I will say is that uh, at the very beginning of my journey, a lot of the conversation with my family was, well, it reflects bad on us. And I'm like, you know what, that that yeah. stinks. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, but it's, uh, there's something going on in my head and I just can't explain it to you guys. I can't explain what connects my brain to my heart and why I do these things. Um, and my mom, she tried a little bit longer. So when I was out drinking, when I was out running amok in the streets, uh, she'd always call me and say, Hey, do you want to talk? You can't come to my house, but you can meet me at a water burger. That was our meeting place. There was one in between us. And she, uh, she would just, she would just try to have conversations with me. And at the time I was just very angry and frustrated. And so those type of conversations usually turned into, uh, the battles of, well, you didn't do this and you didn't do that. And consistently blaming somebody doesn't make them feel good and doesn't give opportunity for a two-way conversation. And because of that, you know, it drove a wedge in our relationship even further. Uh, I stole from my family. That's one thing that I'll admit to doing. Um, I take things and I pawn them off. Uh, I take things and I'd say that they got lost. Um, <laughs> I would run up cards that I had found around the house and then, you know, blame it on someone else. So those are a couple of the examples that really drove a wedge in between me and my family. But one of the major pivotal moments that I'll share um, was when I was living in that abandoned house, probably about age 26. Um, yeah, actually 27. And it was my birthday. Now, I'm a person that doesn't celebrate my birthday. I, I don't like celebrating holidays. I don't like celebrating birthdays. For me, they just always brought on more stress for a family. I, I always seem to see people act one way during the holidays. And then <laughs> the rest of the year, they weren't acting that same way. So in my head, I, I couldn't, I didn't like that. Um, and I didn't like the idea of we're going to celebrate you and be excited about you this one day out of the year. But the rest of the time, you're on your own. Like, I never <laughs> liked that. Um, yeah. So about 27, this is my 27th birthday, actually. I was staying at that house that I was told not to make a coffin. And uh, my sister and my mom showed up. Well, I was paranoid and I was drinking and I had a gun on me. So I'm sleeping in this cot. And uh, I, the way the story is told, because I only remember waking up, uh, is my sister came into the house and she saw that the gun was on me and it was in my hand while I was sleeping, which for me was pretty normal. Like. I, at that point in my life, I slept with a gun um, just because my mind was in some very dark places. I had already participated in a lifestyle that had some uh, consequences, and I hadn't faced those consequences yet. So because of that, I was prepared for whatever might happen. Um, and apparently it freaked her out to the point where she uh, called my mom. Um, and my mom comes and... Uh, she wakes me up and I remember her very gently just kind of touching my arm where the gun was at. And she said, son, you got to get up. And I wake up and I see my mom. I see the gun in my hand. And in my other hand, I have a bottle. And I can see fear in my mom's eyes. And that's one thing that I don't, I didn't mind scaring other people, if that makes sense. But if you were close to me, I didn't ever want you to feel scared around me. So like if you're a random citizen and you had something that I wanted, I'd probably scare you and I'd take it. <laughs> I had no problem with that. But to see the, that same type of fear in my mom's eyes and then my sister kind of peeking around the corner through the door, like is everything going to be okay? What's going to happen? Uh, to see that type of fear in both their eyes uh, really made the, drove the nail home that you're a whole different human being. Mm -hmm. And your original question was what were some of the points that kind of drove our family into division? Uh, some of those points was just me being strong headed, strong willed and not willing to receive help. That's one of the big ones. Uh, not willing to see my own faults and instead blaming someone else was another big one. And the third big one was uh, not seeing the transformation that happened to me while using these substances. Mm -hmm. Those would be three big points that I think everybody can probably relate to. It doesn't have to be as extreme as mine, but 
You could probably see those in your own life if you're struggling with alcohol use uh, or any type of substance use, but alcohol for sure, uh, mainly because it's a legal substance. That's the way I like to look at it. Uh, and in that day, she tells me, uh, I know you don't celebrate your birthday, but we want to celebrate you. And I felt that was pretty touching. I was like, this POS, you want to celebrate me? For what? What, what did I do? And she's like, well, you're still around. And oh. so we're going to celebrate that because we don't know how long it's going to be. And that really was just pivotal because in my head, you know, I'm going to survive. I'm going to make it out. I've already made it about out of everything else. Why wouldn't I get out of this? Um, the idea of reality of Nico, you're, you're, you're in a bad spot. At that time, I weighed probably about 260 pounds. I was bloated. I had already been um, asked to leave my job <laughs> to go sort myself out. Uh, so the indicators were there that I had an issue, but I was the only one who didn't see them. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was a reconnection moment after all the other things that had gone on. So you're 27. How long, how, when did you stop drinking? when I was 27 years old later so on that, that was year. it yeah and have you gone back at all no 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 do you ever think about it oh yeah of course when life gets really stressful and I'm really hurt and I'm really messed up in the head because you know life's life of course when yeah. I when I go to the gas station and I see other people buying alcohol sometimes I'm like man yeah there's a solution but it's not the solution well, and you said something that I, I think I've had this conversation numerous times. This is legal. Alcohol is mm -hmm. legal and it's, and it's everywhere. It's at the gas station. It's at concerts, sporting events, everywhere on TV and in movies. And I think it's brave to admit that it's hard, right? Um, so if my math is correct, that puts you around six, seven years of not yeah. drinking. You got it. And... Uh, what what do you think some of the challenges are for yourself personally and, and just kind of what you see in society and the people that you work with? Um, some of the challenges are that it's not stigmatized and it's not demonized like other substances are. That's one of the biggest ones. Uh, there's a stigma behind it, but that stigma is, well, if you don't drink, it's because you got a problem and that's a you issue. It's not that, yeah. hey, alcohol is an escape mechanism that has been taught to you um, and embedded in you as an okay escape method mm -hmm. um, the only reason why it's an okay escape method is because there's a tax on it and that tax gets collected by who the government uh, and i'm not very big on conspiracy theories but that's just the way that it works once the government can figure out how to tax other substances guess what they make it legal recently they legalized cannabis where i'm from so like, once they figure out how to get their money out of it, they're going to legalize it. It's not because it's good. Just because it's legal doesn't mean that you should do it, right? right? Like, and you're in New Mexico, correct? I'm in New Mexico, yes, ma'am. Yeah. And so uh, the state started uh, allowing it how long ago? Last year. Last year, okay. Um, yeah. And I mean, have you seen an uptick in the usage or people admitting to using it? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. It, there was a $4 million, the first day that they opened it up, $4 million revenue was collected um, mm. in cannabis sales. Um, yeah. And now jobs have no problem with you smoking on your smoke break. They, yeah. they have no issue with it. It's not considered a drug anymore. Uh, so yes, absolutely an uptick. Uh, recently, breweries, when they became those microbreweries came popular, there was an uptick there. And okay. a, Originally, New Mexico, we have a strong, we have a heavy, I should say, DUI uh, uh, rate. Like it's higher than anywhere else in the nation. Wow. And there's reasons for that. Um, one is because, you know, it's rural New Mexico. There's like one big city, two big cities, three big cities. And the rest of it is rural New Mexico. So people are like, well, it's my land. I can do whatever the heck I want on it. Um, right. And there is a idea that alcohol isn't bad um, amongst very many cultures and um, there's a heavy indigenous population here 
of the, I think it's total 29 indigenous nations that are in the United States, 19 of them are here in New Mexico. And uh, there is a strong connection between the indigenous culture and uh, drinking. Mm -hmm. So that's another area of it. Um, so you're asking what are some of the problems that I see? Well, one was what we just talked about. It's legal and it's not demonized. Uh, like if you don't drink, people think that something's wrong with you rather than wondering why the heck. We got to change that drinks. narrative, Nico. <laughs> got to change that because I, you know, the most interesting people I know in this life don't drink. And it's not because of anything other than they just realized life was better without it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And you actually get to experience life. Like when you're not drinking, you get to experience life. And how can you experience a happy moment if you've never felt a sad moment? How mm. can you experience true joy if you've never felt true sadness? And I don't mean true sadness as like a, a death in the family. I don't mean true sadness as your heart's broken. I don't mean true sadness like that. But I mean, have you felt it? Have you sat there when your heart's broken and not trying to heal it with something external, but you found the way internally to acknowledge your emotions, feel what your body's feeling, see where it hurts you, not just in your heart, not just your feelings, but feel your back tense up. That's for me, one of the ways that it happens. Feel my jaw lock up when I'm really sad and when I'm really stressed out. And I'm grateful for those moments because that's how I know that when my jaw is not locked up, when my back isn't tense, that's an elation feeling that I have. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly what you just said. Some of the people that I know who are the most lively, um, they're the ones that don't ingest any type of substance, don't inhale, don't inject. They don't do any of that because they understand that life is meant to be lived and you're not living when you're drinking. You're not, you're masking it. And so if you really want to say that, you know, life is a fun adventure and it's supposed to be experienced, how, the way I look at alcohol is it's like having a VR on your face. Those virtual reality goggles, yeah. that's, that's the way that alcohol is because you're perceiving it through something else rather than perceiving life through your own life experiences. Um, and when you take those, goggles. Yeah. When you take those off, it's life's a whole different ball game. Oh, and you learn how to manage it in a healthy way. I was going to ask you, what are some of the uh, unexpected joys of being undrunken? But I feel like you kind of included it there when you talked about not feeling that heaviness. That's how you know that you're in a state of elation. Is there is there another unexpected joys you found? Oh, absolutely. Um <laughs> When a cop car gets behind me, there's an unexpected <laughs> joy right there. Yeah. I, <laughs> that's, that's an unexpected joy. There's an unexpected joy when I open up my bank account and I know the amount that's there and I'm not scared or anxious about facing what I just did the night before. Mm. There's an unexpected joy um, that comes with knowing that people can call you at any time and you could be present to help them out. One of the biggest joys that I had, uh, me and my family, we have a, mended our relationship, right? My father, uh, me and him still talk. Me and my mother, we have a great relationship now. Uh, but I have a younger sibling, and there was a point where me and that sibling didn't communicate at all um, because of my choices. And recently, that sibling got married, and they asked me to stand in their wedding. Like, there's a, that's an unexpected joy. That people can count on you again. Yeah. That's, for me, that just gets me excited. And then after that, they had some kids. And I get to be like the cool uncle. <laughs> that's that's an unexpected joy that I, I wish everybody could experience. And not so much in, oh, you get to have the family back. And, oh, you get to be the cool uncle. But like that you get to be yourself and know that people love you for you being you. That's an unexpected joy because there was a point where I didn't even love myself, i.e. why I would cover up my feelings, i.e. why I would self-harm with substances and alcohol. Um, because for me, alcohol is a poison. If you look at it chemically, it's actually a poison. And so you're self-harming. Um, yeah. 
and to not need that and still love myself, that's that's an unexpected joy that I get every morning. Uh, when I wake up knowing that I don't have to like look at look at a face that I don't like. Like that's an unexpected joy every morning because for 13 years of my life, most of my adulthood, basically 14 to 27, uh, that developmental stage, I didn't like myself. And so now there's an unexpected joy of, hey, I get to rediscover who I am. I get to learn about myself, learn what makes me tick, learn what makes me go, learn what makes me stay, learn what makes me actually happy, um, learn what... I will let through my face gates and what I won't let through my face gates because of how they stimulate my mind, right? And face gates is your ears, your eyes, your nose, uh, your mouth. Those are your face gates. So what you do let in and out of those, you have control over. I love that. With that poison, you don't, right? Like you hear things differently. You see things differently. For me, I'd lose a sense of smell because alcohol was so strong that nothing else really smelled for me. And then, you know, the things, the terms that would come out of my mouth, there wasn't, there wasn't as strong of a filter um, because I can still say the things that I want to express, but I don't say it as harshly, right? Like if somebody makes me mad because it's an emotion, it's a feeling, right. I don't cuss them out and berate them, right? I have a way of explaining like, hey, you can't treat me that way. It's not a way, acceptable way for you to talk to me rather than, you know, some other ideas that I'm sure our listeners can plug in the blank for. Yeah, that drunken lash out. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So you're at 27 and you yourself realized, maybe with some influence from others, that that you had a problem and it was time to make a shift. What are some of the resources that you found that helped you? Um, so I went off the unbeaten path is what I hear. Um, I went to AA meetings. Uh, and it's a great program. It is. It just wasn't for me. I went to the church meetings and they have great opportunities there, but they just weren't for me. Uh, then I went to uh, treatment centers, uh, sat in group meetings, and those just weren't for me either. Uh, I said it earlier that I'm stubborn and I don't like being told what to do. So, that, so that's a good and a bad thing. A good thing because I was going to figure out a solution that worked for me. A bad thing because, well, in order to get help, people have to tell you what to do. Uh, and I'm struggling, like white knuckling through staying sober, right? For me, it's just, mm -hmm. all right, dude, you made it through heroin withdrawals. You can make it through alcohol withdrawals. And I'm speaking from experience. Heroin makes you feel like you're going to die. Like, that's how the withdrawals feel. Alcohol withdrawals, they can kill you. Yeah. Literally can kill you. I was hospitalized um, because I had a seizure from withdrawals. And uh, I woke up in the hospital and I defecated myself. And I was like, oh, this is serious. Like, this isn't like something else that I face because I can't just cold turkey it. So for me, what I did is I uh, started to titrate. That was one of the resources that I used harm reduction is another way to describe it. But I promised and I made a commitment to myself that I wouldn't drink. I was at two bottles every day. So I told myself I wouldn't drink more than a bottle and a half. And I just started putting those self limitations. Um, I also started watching what I listened to. Like there was certain music that I listened to and it, it would bring back thoughts from my past. And those thoughts from my past would trigger a response, an automatic response for me, which was where's liquor? Where's alcohol? Mm -hmm. Because I need to stop these thoughts. Um, and for me, what I found was personal development was the greatest resource. So while a lot of other um, avenues will say you're powerless against this thing, personal development says, hey, you have the power to overcome this because of everything that you've been through and not on some... Uh, you're the greatest thing out there, but look how many days you survived. A hundred percent success rate on your worst days. So can you make this day? Yes, you can. Mm -hmm. And what is it that makes you think in the way that drives you to the action of drinking? 
that's one of the biggest points that I learned from personal development was that my thoughts, what goes on between my ears creates my feelings. And if I can control the thought, then I control the feeling because the feeling causes the action. So one of the tools that I've now created for the people that I help out is this tool called WAIT. And it's an acronym for what am I thinking? I'm not so much concerned on the action when you're first starting to remove this uh, behavior from your life. What I'm more concerned about is what drove you to that action. Mm -hmm. What emotion were you feeling? And what thought created that emotion? So what are you thinking? What am I thinking? is the best tool and resource that I ever found. And I attribute a lot of my success to a man that I don't even, I've never even met. Um, his name is Dr. Eric Thomas, ET, the hip hop preacher is what he goes by. And he has videos that he was giving out every Monday. Thank God it's Monday. And then he has a podcast, the secret to success podcast. It's like 400 episodes deep. And he talks about his own struggles, which were complete opposite ones of mine. Um, but the foundational principles all apply. And so this journey of personal development, like I can do better today than I did yesterday. I can be a better version of myself today than I was yesterday was one of the greatest resources that I found. Mm. Also reading books from other individuals who had lived um, through similar experiences. That was very helpful for me. Uh, Nikki Six has a book called uh, Heroin Diaries. I read that one and I was like, oh yeah, there's other people that think the way that you think. You're not as isolated. And I'm sorry, I say it in a kind of uh, a way that hurts people's feelings, but you're not that special. Right. You're a special human being and you're a special spirit. Yes, I agree with that. But you're not so special that no one else hasn't dealt with some of the things that you've dealt with. So why would you try to face them alone? The other things, resources that I found uh, very beneficial and helpful were accountability and community like however you find accountability and community that's what all of these programs have as underlying foundations whether it's 12 steps uh, church groups whether it's medically assisted treatments whether it's inpatient treatment outpatient treatment they all boil down to accountability to someone and community with other people so if you can find a community of individuals and you can be strong enough to be held accountable. That's another resource that I think changes it. Mm. One of the last things was, is that decision-making. How good or bad are you at decision-making? Because if you're not good at decision-making, then that's one of the roots for why you're making poor decisions. <laughs> if you need somebody to help you out with decision-making, that's why they have these uh sponsors that's why they have these mentors that's why they have these coaches because your decision making is poor acknowledge it and be around people who have made better decisions so that you can learn their thought processes and by learning their thought processes you can learn how your emotions react to those thoughts and that's like thought. a little bomb right there because i mean recovery or not surround yourself with people who are doing better than you I mean, raise that bar. I love that. I do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so what is one lesson alcohol's taught you that you think everyone should know? Wow, that's a great question, Courtney. Um, one lesson that alcohol has taught me that I think everybody else could learn from um, is standard setting. We were just mm. talking about it, but there's a standard that everybody chooses to live by. Um, if you live in America, and that's the only place that I've lived, you have so many freedoms and there is a plateau where you can't fall below. Like, mm. That's where our country's set up, is that you can't fall below a certain plateau. They're, they're not going to let you. And I hear somebody thinking, well, Nico, how can we have homeless? How can we have all these people on the street? How can we have all that? Well, it's because they're choosing to live below that plateau because they're not wanting to follow certain standards that are established by society. That's why. Okay. So if society has a standard for us, which let's use alcohol, a legal standard. It's legal. Are you going to fall to that standard or are you going to rise above it? 
Ooh. And for me, in my life, I choose to live above the standard that society has set. Society says drinking is okay. That doesn't mean it's okay for my standard of living. Society says that you can have, what is it, 0 0.8, 0 0.08 alcohol in your body, and you're still going to be considered sober. That's below my standard. My standard is 0 0.00. There's no alcohol in my body. And that's the bare minimum that I'm ever going to reach. So that's one thing that alcohol has taught me is that there's a standard society has for society. And you can either meet that standard and be like everybody else, or you could raise yourself above that standard and live at a different level than everybody else lives. I love that. Would you say that to your younger self? Oh, absolutely. Now, would my younger self listen? Do you think that there's anything you could have said to your younger self? Um, I think the one thing that I could have said to my younger self is you're not alone in this mm -hmm. journey because my younger self really felt alone and isolated. And because I felt alone and isolated in my familial network, I thought, why would anybody else want me? If that makes any sense. Oh, I'm like getting it, the feels on that one, Nico. Yeah. Like, I think, uh, I think everybody under the age of 17 should hear you are not alone. Yeah. So I think if I had been told that, um, that would have been a strong connection maker. The other thing, uh, real fast that the younger self probably would have listened to is somebody that I would admire. Like there are certain things that I would, like I admired and I'd never seen anybody do it. So I thought that it wasn't possible. And so letting them know, hey, there's other people out there yeah. that are living that way and have been living that way for generations, that would have excited me and been like, well, I got to get around them. <laughs> I got to get around them. Oh, I love so what's your favorite thing about being undrunken? My favorite thing about being undrunken. Um, not having to delete text messages. That's one of my favorite things. That's one thing that I notice a lot of people do that I work with. Uh, they'll just go into their text messages and they'll just delete conversations. And I'm like, what? You can't face your, your what you said? And there's this feeling, and I used to do it myself, that like, yeah, uh, you call it the drunken lash out. But I also think that there's a shame that comes along with it that you don't want to feel when you're hungover. Yeah. Like you're already feeling shameful. You're already feeling guilty. So why would you want to have to read that text message? Um, that's one of my favorite things. Like my phone isn't so much a scary thing to look at anymore. <laughs> the messages that come through, they're not, hey, you texted me last night. Do you remember what you said? Or <laughs> like, yeah, that's that's why were you calling things. me at 3 a.m.? Yeah. 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 The phone isn't scary. Yeah. That's for sure one of my favorite things about being undrunken. What is something that you have done or do currently that is normally associated with being drunk or needing a drink? Um, something that I currently do that is associated with drinking. Uh, like for some going... people, like liquid courage. Right. They need yeah, yeah, that yeah. liquid courage. Yeah. yeah. And I, I'll be honest, I still visit bars. Like I still go to bars and I'll go hang out with friends while they drink. Um, I don't recommend that for anybody that's within the first like 24 months. A absolutely not. Um, and for years, I didn't go to bars at all. But that's one of the things like I, I don't mind going to a bar with some friends. They're all watching the game and get some good wings get a nice yeah. burger, some pizza, fries, and just hanging out. Uh, and that's usually associated with drinking, right? Going to the bars is associated with drinking. And just a side note on that, they are originally called public houses. And public houses were gathering places for the community. The reason why they gathered in that community setting was because it was cheaper to uh, keep one place warm than a bunch of other houses. And mm. That's where public houses got changed to pubs. That's where pubs got changed to bars. So if you do the history on some of the stuff that we participate in, it was really that community aspect of it. 
that so just has been turned to being an alcohol. Yeah. Alcohol no, I love that. Funny. Like I, I, I'm the same. I love being out with my friends and, you know, these days a lot less of them are consuming, which is wonderful. Um, but it's all about, you know, gathering for sure. For sure. What do you drink when you're out? Liquid death. Ooh, yeah. Yeah. When that first came out a couple of years ago, I was like, what? I can have a can here in my hand and not be questioned about it. Um, I also like sparkling water with lime, sparkling water with some cranberry juice, um, grapefruit juice, mango juice. Uh, I think they call them mocktails now. Uh, but that's what I like to drink. I like to drink some sort of juice, some sort of tea um, or water. Yeah. And there's different varieties of it. Oh, that's okay. I love to do quick fire with all of my guests. Are you familiar Let's with quick it. fire? Yeah, you can ask me a bunch of questions and I just give you the first thing that pops off my mind. That's right. So a sentence or two on how being undrunken has affected these spokes in your wheel of life. My version of the wheel of life has seven spokes. Ready? Got you. Yeah. All right. So how has being undrunken affected work? Being undrunken has affected work because I can work for myself. Um, that's one of the best things that I found about being undrunken. I don't have to worry about going around people and smelling. <laughs> How has being undrunken affected money? I got more of it. Um, and I can use, or some crazy, like if you're using it for positive things, more of it comes to you. So, How has being undrunken affected love life? Being drunken has taken off the beer goggles. Um, so now tens are actually tens. <laughs> <laughs> How has being undrunken affected family? Uh, that's my favorite one. There's a connection amongst family now. And it's not so much, oh, Nico's coming over. It's, yay, Nico's coming over. How has being undrunken affected spirituality? Being undrunken has increased my spirituality. For me, there's a, sorry, I'm going to add a couple more sentences on this one. That's all right. There are three ways to change your mindset, your paradigm. And I think that individuals who overdrink have access that one of those ways. And there is something true that comes with what you see when you're drinking. So three ways is basically overconsumption of a substance or poison, alcohol or other drugs. The other way is repetition. That's why you see those monks or people in traditional religions repeat certain things over and over. And the third way is extreme moments in time, um, crazy events that happen, deaths, births, uh, life altering events. Um, being undrunken has enhanced my ability to see the spirituality of life in a far greater way. Hmm. How has being undrunken affected friends? I realized who actually are my friends. And for the last, but my favorite spoke of the Wheel of Life, how has being undrunken affected self? Oh, this is a beautiful question. Uh, being undrunken has allowed me to meet my true self and trust myself and have faith in myself and not doubt myself and be encouraged by myself and explore myself in ways that I never would be able to if I was drunk. That's so beautiful. So I mentioned when we first got started, you're an author. You wrote an amazing book that uh, I read just an excerpt from, Five Things to Know Before You Get Sober. Please, please share with my listeners about this book and why they should go pick it up. Yeah, for sure. Um, I wrote this book within the first couple of years of my recovery journey. And the reason why I wrote it was because I was answering the same questions over and over again. Uh, so it was a little bit of a selfish reason because people would come and see the change that I had made in my life and be like, well, how'd you do it? Why'd you do it? What can I tell somebody that needs to do it? And the five things that I came up with because I've done kicking substances my whole life was it's a joy. There's a joy. That's why your first question blew my mind because it's that same topic. There's a joy. Uh, the fourth thing, I should say, the fifth thing is a joy. The fourth thing is you're vulnerable during the transition. The third thing is 
you're going to get to know who you are. The second thing is that it's uncomfortable. And if your listeners want to get the first thing, they can go get the book. Uh, but the reason why I wrote that is because there's a lot of literature on why you should stop. There's a lot of literature on how to stop. But that is the second portion of it. Like There's a phase in the stages of change where you're thinking about it and you kind of want to know some answers before you actually make the step. And there's very limited literature on that. And so I saw that gap. And because I have an extended amount of knowledge on that area, um, that's why I produced the book. Awesome. And you do public speaking and keynotes. Um, share a little bit about that too. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, uh, Courtney. Yeah, so what I do is I take the life experience that I had, the pain that caused me to go down the route that I went, and I share that with other individuals so that they can know that they're not alone. And I've been able to do this in front of groups of five, six at an outpatient treatment center. I've been able to do this in front of 1,600 people um, at school events. Um, and that's some of the keynotes that I talk about is the tools that I used, the history that I went through, just so I can bring people aware of what they're thinking. And in addition to that, I do trainings for uh, state and government agencies, behavioral health treatment centers that are, one, uh, looking to develop themselves and make a connection because there is a vocabulary that's used amongst clinicians that needs to be translated into real life experience. And I have tools that are scientifically backed and HR approved uh, to make that connection for individuals so that more people can be helped. Uh, my goal is to use everything that I went through as a, a bridge to make sure that individuals can come to this other side of this undrunken side. Yeah, I love that. And how, so how do we find you? What's your website? All the good stuff. Website is no halo NM. Um, no halo nm.com is my website. That's where you can find all the information and best way to get in contact with me. Um, the second best ways is social media. Um, and those are at no halo nm. Um, because I don't believe anybody's built to be a perfect little angel. I think that everybody should have no halo. That's my personal that. opinion. Uh, so that's why I named my organization that. But at no halo nm on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, they recently had me create a TikTok, and that one is just using my name, which is at Nico double underscore Morales, and you'll be able to find me there. Awesome. Awesome. And um, if somebody wanted to hire you, they could find that information on your website, correct? Website. Yes, ma'am. Website is the source of all of it. Perfect. And I'll put a link to your book on the show notes as well. Nico, is there any question I didn't ask you that you wish I had asked? No, this was a great conversation. So I thank you so much for your questions. They're thought provoking. They're interesting. They're exciting. So it was awesome. Awesome. Well, I'm really, really grateful to have had you on the show. And I look forward to talking with you more and keeping you in the loop with Undrunken and what we've got going on here. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Awesome. Have a wonderful rest of your day, Nico. Thank you so much for joining me. I look forward to sharing more with you as we continue to explore being undrunken together with friends. I hope the Undrunken podcast is helpful and inspiring to all of you out there. So if you liked this episode, please send it to a friend and help share these stories with more people.